chapter 21. We've been in this series called Walking in Power. Um, last week, we were uh, all about hearing God's voice. We had Pastor Justin in town from Houston. He Didn't he preach a great word? about hearing the voice of God. And, and basically, we, if you're new around here, we're in this expository study of the book of Acts. We've been going verse by verse. We've been in it for almost two years, and we're getting close to the end. So Acts chapter 21 is where we're going to be at today. We're going to work from 17 to 40 today. And what's interesting is, is what's going to happen in this passage is all kind of compounding to what Acts chapter 20 and Acts, the beginning of Acts chapter 21 was. Acts chapter 20, Paul is there and with the Ephesian elders, and he tells them this. He tells them this word, listen, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm trying to get there for Pentecost, and I am constrained by the Spirit. In other words, I'm so compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, even though the Holy Spirit has told me that imprisonment and inflictions await me. And then when you get a little, bit long, a little bit later into Acts chapter 21, you see Agabus, the prophet Agabus, that gives him a word. And he says, listen, if you go to Jerusalem, you need to stay here. You will be bound. You will be bound by chains, and your life will not be good. And Paul, and Paul didn't listen to him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had, had already spoke to him, and he's like, I'm going. You know? and, and it wasn't conflicting words of knowledge. It was basically... Call knew he needed to go no matter what. Agabus just didn't know that, so Agabus, Agabus was trying to warn him, and Paul goes anyway. So now where we're picking up in the story is Paul essentially is ending his third missionary tour, his final missionary tour, and he is getting to Jerusalem, and it's really from here on out from the next seven, eight chapters, we've got seven chapters left, um, it's going to be a life of hardship for Paul. Paul is going to face a lot of of persecution, high-level persecution, and, um, and it's still God is going to use him in a mighty way. I'm going to read Acts chapter 21, verse 17 through 20 real quick, just to give us that context. It says this, when Paul and his missionary team had come to Jerusalem, the brothers, they received us gr uh, gladly. On the following day, Paul went with us to James. Now remember, Jerusalem is like the headquarters of, of the, the early church. And so anytime Paul would do a missionary tour, he would end it, and he would go to Jerusalem to tell James, who is the leader of that church, all that happened, everything that took place during that missionary tour. So it says that all the elders were present in the next verse. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified God. They said to them, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have come to know Jesus because of of your witness. As a matter of fact, I'll show you the map real quick. And so we are, this is the last time we'll have to use this map. Can you, is the map still up there? I don't know if I'll put it in there. It's the, yeah, there we go. Um, and so if, remember last time we kind of talked, we were, we were in Ephesus. He made that, that trip around, I, I believe it was in Patero, uh, right here where uh, Agabus spoke to uh, Paul. And then he went ahead and came down, Jerusalem's down. Oh, no, it's actually in Tyre where uh, Agabus was. And then he goes into Jerusalem and ends his missionary tour there. So, uh, by the way, those three missionary tours, Paul walked over 10,000 miles preaching the gospel. And could you imagine that? 10,000 miles. He walked. We got vehicles today, you know. Like, he didn't even take a camel, I don't know. He might have took a camel, but he, I mean, his, I bet you his calf muscles were just, you know. If you're taking notes, which I hope that you are, you can title today's message simply this, Protecting Your Witness. Protecting your witness. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for all that you're doing today. Thankful that you are in this place right now. I pray that as we open up your word, you would encourage us and empower us, challenge us and renew, uh, convict us, renew us and refresh us today, God. Help us to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You ever had somebody just misunderstand you before? Right? Like somebody started gossiping about you or spreading lies about you or talking about you. And in reality, they're causing harm. But if they would just talk to you, it was just a simple misunderstanding that could get reconciled. You ever, you ever had a situation like that? I think everybody has, right? I, I remember in, in high school, I played, uh, I played basketball. I played for this, this small school called French Settlement. I graduated with like 50 people, you know, very small school. And we had a... a a rivalry like Holden High School was our rivals. Matter of fact, it was an intense rival. It was so bad that 
there were so many consecutive years of fights that would take place during the game that they actually banned us from playing them for about three or four years. So I remember the last time we had played them, I was like in eighth grade and in a high school game, and one of our dudes almost choked out another guy. Like, it was bad. You know, so they actually banned us from playing them for a few, a few years. And, uh, and then we get to our junior year, and we're able to play them again. And I remember when we, we size up, I'm sizing up to some other guy next to me, and he's talking smack to me. I'm talking smack to him. He's playing really dirty. I don't play dirty. You know, like, I didn't like this guy. So, of course, I'm talking smack about him to my teammates. He's probably talking smack to me about his teammates. And every time we met, it was like a fight. Like, I'm telling you, like, I don't know if you know what a screen is, but, like, one time, there was, say this is a guy who was setting a screen for me, and I was coming around, and he literally punched me in the gut as I was coming around, and, like, like just gave me a low blow on the way. Like, just played dirty. Did not like the guy at all. And, uh, and so, anyways, I, anytime somebody would bring up Holden, I was like, oh, that guy right there, I'm telling you what, and I was probably gossiping about him, all those things. Well, we both, we graduate, and I go to my first few years before I went to Bible college, I went to Southeastern Louisiana University down the road, and I was, went to the Pennington Center to, to play pickup, and guess who's there? <laughs> Your boy. And so I'm like, I'm not playing on his team. Somehow we got picked and put on the same team together. So now we got to play together. The next thing you know, we're playing, and we like the Splash Brothers out there. You know, I'm throwing it to him. He's hitting. He's throwing it to me, hitting. Next thing you know, we go get lunch together, and we became good friends. <laughs> like, I don't even, I, I, like, I, I was like, bro, I used to think you were a jerk. And he's like, bro, I thought you were a jerk, too. You was super arrogant. No, no, no. Like, we just went back and forth. I'm like, man, it was just a, we just mistaken each other's competitiveness for, you know, jerkish behavior. And, uh. And so we ended up being good friends, and it was just a misunderstanding, and thank goodness we got to reconcile, you know, and, and that just happens in life. You can have misunderstandings, and things can happen. The, the sad thing for Paul is Paul is about to be really misunderstood right here. The problem, though, is that the people on the other side have no, no interest in reconciling. Matter of fact, at this point, Paul is going to have a pretty rough life, and it's not good. Matter of fact, what, what he's being misunderstood about can be seen in Acts chapter 21, verse 20. Remember, it says that they're, they're celebrating life change through Jesus. They're celebrating all that God did. It says when they heard it, they glorified God, right? All the people who, who, were, who came to know the God, they were all zealous for the law. But look at the next part. So James is, James is like, man, it's so good, to, uh, so good to know all of this. But I got to tell you something, Paul. I got to share some news with you. He says, listen, all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake, uh, he said, they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? For they will certainly know that you are here. So what was happening, remember, it's Pentecost. So you didn't just have the Jews of Jerusalem that were there. Even all the Jews from Asia Minor, where he was doing most of his ministry, are also there. All the riots that he started that we've been reading through, yeah, they're all there. Everybody there. And they're gonna, surely they're going to hear, Paul, that you're in town and something, it might not be so good. And you think about Paul is, it, is that he wasn't actually telling them to forsake Moses or to not circumcise their kids. That's not, not what he was saying at all. What he was saying is those things do not save you. They do not bring salvation. It's by faith alone that you're saved. And we saw that in Acts chapter 15 when we studied that. So he's not telling them to forsake Moses. He's not telling them to not circumcise their children. He's not doing that at all. He's simply being misunderstood. He's just saying that shouldn't take prior priority in believing that it will save you. It's by faith alone that you are saved. Yet these Jews didn't see it that way. And they're going to get really mad at Paul, and they're going to attack Paul's character from here on out, and he's going to have a life of hardship, but we're going to also get to see how powerfully God works in and through him, even in the midst of his opposition. But as we go through this part of the first part of the story today, I had a few observations I wanted to show you, and I believe that it could help you and I be able to protect our witness, the influence of our witness. How many of you know we're called to be a witness, right? Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it's the thematic verse of the entire book of Acts. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witness. We're called to be witnesses, but we have, when we witness, we have influence, right? And we've got to be able to protect the influence of our witness. 
And let's see how Paul does it, because Paul does a really good job at protecting his influence as he witnesses, even in the midst of what he is going to take, uh, have happen to him right here. So a few things you can write down. The first one is this. First of all, don't compromise your witness. Don't compromise your witness. So what's going to happen right here is James is essentially going to give Paul instruction on what to do. There's a lot of misunderstandings about you. There's a lot of lies about you. This is what I need you to do to help try to bring some type of reconciliation with those Jews. And this is what he tells him. Acts chapter 21, verse 23. He says, do therefore, this is James talking, do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. So it's a, a Nazarite vow. It's a purification type of uh, Jewish custom that he's doing. And he says this, take these men and purify yourself along with them. And pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observation of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you remember in Acts chapter 15, this was the, the part where... They believed, you know, the Jews got saved, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's like, listen, so we don't offend the Jews, at least they would follow some of our customs, because this was a big thing. This is a, uh, a, a lot of hate in this time between Jewish and Gentiles. It says, then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and he went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled, and the offering presented for each one of them. So in an effort to prove the Jews wrong in their misunderstandings, Paul decides, I'm going to take part in a Nazarite vow, a Jewish custom, and not only am I going to do it, I'm going to pay for uh, four other men to do it with me, right? I'm, like, I'm really going to show that I'm on this, I'm, it's, I'm not the person that they're telling me they are. And this really is the heart of Paul. Why? Because Paul wants to be able to preach to everybody. He wants to be able to have his influence for witnessing to any type of person, whether they were Jew or Gentile. Matter of fact, we see this heart from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. When he's writing to the church of Corinth, he says this in verse 19. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, became as one under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, became as one outside the law. That's not meaning sinful behavior, by the way. That I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I had become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So what's Paul saying? Paul's saying no matter what my surroundings and my audience was, I was going to make sure that I adapt to it so that I could have influence to witness to them. That's what he's saying. Okay? What he's not saying is that if they were sinning, I went and sinned with them so they'd accept me so I could witness to them. That's not what he's saying. He wouldn't sin to do that. He, what he's not saying is I'm going to go hang out with this crowd and affirm their sin so that they can, okay, can think I'm popular and good and then I can witness to them. That's not what Paul's saying at all. Paul's saying I adapt it to their customs, their traditions, in order to be able to have influence to them. So you're thinking, what does that even look like for us as believers, right? Like, if that's what he's doing, what does that look like? Because I'm not just talking about the compromising and sin. You should never do that. You should never compromise your witness with sinful behavior. What I'm talking about is doing something that would hinder the ability for you to witness to unbelievers in whatever environment you're in. For example, I'll use a pastoral example. Say I was asked to go and preach at another church. A lot of times when that happens, I will ask them things like, hey, what does the pastor wear? You know, because maybe it's a church that I'm going to go to and the pastor wears suit and tie. And they ain't going to like this, right? If I showed up wearing this, they're going to probably be mad at me. And some of them will probably be offended by it. And they won't listen to me, right? And it would be dishonoring for me to do that. So if they're telling me, hey, we, pastor wears suit and tie here, guess what? Pastor Ryan's going to wear a suit and tie and he's going to go preach there. Why? Because I don't want to hinder my ability to be able to witness to those people, right? I mean, it comes to the same thing with drinking. You know, drinking is not a sin. Getting drunk is a sin, but drinking alcohol is not a sin. And there are a lot of pastors that, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but 
I have a side marketing business where I, I, I coach a lot of pastors across the country and marketing and systems and stuff like that. And, and um, matter of fact, Pastor Justin last week, he's one of them that I've, I've coached for a few years. And, and so the reality is, what, across, and he doesn't do this, but across the board, I've seen a lot of churches, small groups, pastors, they will have a small group that's geared towards like, you know, instead of going to get coffee or going to get lunch, it's, hey, let's go crack a cold one together. You know, I've heard of pastors who say, hey, I had this new guy came to church. And I just told him, hey, let's go crack a, a cold one together, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There isn't, but you don't know that person's story, right? If that person's dealing with alcoholism and addiction to it, then you're essentially hindering your ability to witness to them because you're now feeding them the very thing the devil's been feeding them in order to keep them tripped up. You know, so that's why me and Leah, we've, we've decided, like, hey, we're... In a, in a town like New Orleans, right, a lot of people think the only thing they can do to have fun around here is, is go drink, to, right? I mean, if you want to drink a glass of wine and all that, hey, that's, get it, drinking is not a sin. Jesus turned water into wine. Getting plastered is. Getting drunk is, right? And I won't even go into the, the substance, you know, the, what could happen there. But the reality is, is that when, if, so me and Leah, we decided, hey, we're not going to, we know a lot of people in New Orleans, they deal with that. They deal with, I mean, we've been pastoring for eight years now. We know a lot of people deal with alcohol consumption and, and abuse. And so we decided, hey, if we want to see Jesus set people free from it, we can't do it. We're not even going to drink. And so we take ourselves out of that. We don't go casually drink and, and, and all over the place. That's just not how, we, not how we roll. I'm not going to ask a new person, let's go crack a cold one. We're going to go get lunch or get coffee, you know. But it's why. It's because I want to protect my witness. Even on my senior trip, you know, it was, it was, this is an interesting, uh, uh, my senior trip, I was, I was seen at, 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 the, um, at my school, uh, I was like the, the president of our FCA club, and I was, the, uh, I was a student leader at our youth ministry, and, and so I didn't, I didn't do the things, I didn't go to the parties and stuff like that, and, um, and I know that, like, there was a, we went on a senior trip, and I didn't know all my friends were going on that senior trip, and we all went together. And I'm hanging out with them, and, and you know, my parents are letting me hang with them, and, and they're, you know, they're drinking and having a good time. Their parents were letting them drink. We're on a cruise boat. And there were so many times they were like, come on, Ryan, drink with us, drink with us, drink with us. And, I mean, 18 years old, I was like, yeah, you know, almost I, a few times I was like, man, I should do it. And so I went and asked my mom. I was like, hey, mom, you know, my parents were really good about always just being open with me and, and talking with me. And so I just went and asked, mom, would you, would you mind if I, uh, if I drink with my friends tonight? And she told me something I would never forget. She looked at me and she said, Ryan, for the last four years, you've been witnessing to that group of friends. You've been trying to get them to come to church. You've been trying to tell them about Jesus. The moment you take a sip, you will probably lose that influence because now you haven't separated yourself anymore. And she told me that, and it stuck with me. I was like, you know what? I can't. And 14 years later, I could tell you how many of them have called me in times of need. Like, still, I ain't talked to some of them in years, and all of a sudden, they jump in my Facebook Messenger group needing prayer, needing advice, because they remember what happened in high school. See, your influence matters. Your witness matters. And it might even take years before it ever comes to fruition, but it matters. I mean, why do you think, I even think about church, right? Like, 60 years ago, church was lights all on, pews, right? Maybe an organ player a little bit, you know? Like, ch churches were way different back then to what they are now. But then in the 70s and the 80s, rock and roll music really started to pick up steam. I don't know. I'm a sucker for 80s rock, y'all. I ain't going to lie. Like, I love, love it, love it, love it, love it. And, uh, and so, you know, you got, you got, as that music got, you know, you had a lot of churches starting to what? Adapt to it. Churches started throwing the fuse out. They started throwing the chairs out. You know, they started playing louder music, and they started having lights make it seem like a concert, and then it caused a big war in the church. Oh, that's all going, people going to hell that do that, you know, like this, this thing. But what was happening was that if you actually look today, all the traditional liturgical churches that still do that, a lot of them are declining. Why? Because culture is evolving, and although the message, should never, the message cannot change, the message is the same. The method will change sometimes. Sometimes we have to adapt the method in order to reach them. Now, I'm not talking about compromising our truth. You never compromise the truth of God's word. You always stand on truth. But sometimes, you know, there's some people that are going to love the worship here, and there's some people that are not. But maybe we've never reached them if we didn't 
adapt to that. Are you getting what I'm saying today? The influence of your witness. The whole idea here is to be aware of is to be aware of your surroundings, the opportunities that you have, and that God places around you and ask yourself, you know, how can you best present the gospel to them? Like at your workplace, everybody works here, right? If you go to your work and you're never showing up on time and you're unkind to your your employ your coworkers and you get caught up in the gossiping talks with other people about others and you're not separating yourself at all from the world. And so you're compromising your witness and your influence. As believers, we need to, as hard as it can be sometimes, we need to show up at work on time, right? We need to, the Bible says, so everything we do with our hands, do it with all of our might for the Lord. So we need to show up on time. We need to be kind to others. We don't need to talk about others. We need to encourage them. We need to work the best that we can. We need to be honorable. Like, I'm, you know, I, I know you could, like, in my job, you know, I got something really unfair happened to me, what, two weeks ago? And you know what I did? I didn't complain about it. I didn't set up a meeting so I could, you know, talk about it with other people. I just shut my mouth and said, you know, I understand. Yes, sir. And went on with it. You know, like sometimes you don't want to compromise the witness that you have. And Paul, that's what he's trying to do here. That's why Paul, in the first place, did the Jewish custom. He's saying, listen, I want these people to realize I'm not telling them to forsake Moses. I'm not telling them to not do Jewish customs. I'm just telling them that you don't get saved that way, right? That's what he's trying to say. Don't compromise your witness. The second thing is this. Let opposition be an opportunity for you to witness. Let opposition be an opportunity for you to witness. Look, look at it, Acts chapter 21, verse 27. It says, when the seven days were almost complete, the seven days of the Nazarite vow, the purification ceremony thing, that custom that Paul was doing, the Jews from Asia, remember I told you, everybody's there for Pentecost, so you got Jews from all over the area. That's why you got a lot of people there uh, in Jerusalem. Seeing Paul in the temple, they stirred up the whole crowd and they laid hands on him. The next part. Crying out, they said, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. So right here, actually, I'm going to read one more verse and then it will give you the context. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they suppose, look at your neighbor say suppose. They suppose that Paul had brought him into the temple. So in other words, what they're saying is, this man, they caught him in the middle of a Jewish custom. They're trying to say that Paul doesn't care about Jewish customs or any of that stuff, yet he's in the middle, he's about to end one, and they grab him, lay hands on him, pull him, and say, men of Israel, this guy, this guy is full of it. He's speaking lies. Matter of fact, we saw him in the temple with a Gentile. Well, we suppose we did. <laughs> and what's crazy in that time period, they had a, in the temple area, they had a court of Gentiles area. The Gentiles were only meant to be in that area. If they were to trespass that area, it, they were sentenced to death. Like, and the Roman guards let them, they were so sensitive to that Jewish law that they let them do it. Didn't like, get involved or anything. So they're trying to say, Paul took Gentiles past the court of Gentiles. The court of Gentiles. He, he trespassed. So he needs to die. We suppose he did it. So all the lies that are being thrown out at Paul. It says, then all of the city was stirred up. And the people ran together and they seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And so what ends up happening is... Remember in Acts chapter 21, Agabus says, if you go to Jerusalem, you will be bound by two chains on each arm and on your feet. If you go, I'm, I'm skipping a few verses, but what happens is Paul eventually, he, that's what happens. The, the, pro, the word of Agabus comes to reality as Paul has a chain on this arm, a chain on this arm that two Roman guards are walking with him, and he's bound by his feet. And they get him chained together. And he's in a really tough spot. And matter of fact, from here on out, he's going to face a whole lot of opposition. How many of you know that's a lot of opposition right there? You're trying to preach the gospel, and they're trying to kill you. 
They trying to throw lies at you, slander at you, gossip about you. He's just being misunderstood, but that's what's happening to him. He gets bound, ready to kill, and they're going to have court against him. And then it ha- in verse 34, this happens. It says, some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. So the, the riot is so bad, they thought Paul was going to die in that moment, that the Roman guards, who typically don't care about these type of things, pick Paul up and try to get him out of there. And they're trying to, they're not really cared. I would say they don't care about Paul's life. They more care about just keeping order. So they pick Paul up, and they're going up the steps, right? And, and look what happens. This is, this is interesting to me, right? Because the mob, they're, they're following, they're crying out, away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? May I say something to you? Now, listen, Paul has every opportunity right now to be silent and thinking to himself, I'm about to get capped. <laughs> He has every opportunity to cry for help. Help me, help me, somebody. I didn't do this. He has every, everything he could do right now. Maybe he, he has every opportunity to curse back at him, right? He could get angry, mad, rebel back at them. All of those things. But the question that he asked in the midst of the uproar suggests someone who was calm, Right? He didn't care about the lies that were being spoken against him. He didn't care about what, that they wanted to take his life. The entire time, Paul was scoping an opportunity to preach the gospel. He says, may I say something to you? What does your witness look like when opposition comes against you? What do you look like when things start happening in your life that are hard? People go through opposition in their life, right? I've seen it a lot. My life, people that call church on a mission home and their, their life. And a lot of time what I see is the response is isolation, right? I see anger. I see rebellion. A lot of those things will happen. We will go through a hard time in our life and all of a sudden it's like it's God's fault for what we're going through and we hinder our ability to witness because we start acting like a child. You know, like my child, y'all pray for my four-year-old. You know, he is, he's, he's starting to talk back now. You know what I'm saying? He's starting to talk back. And this is just the beginning, you know. This is, this is it's going to be a while. And, and so some of the things he's told us, and I think the other day his mom, and he like, because he's all into wrestling and stuff, his mom got on and he turned around and bowed at her like that. I was like, boy, I'm about to wipe you off the floor with this. You, know, you bow at her again like that. You know, like, I don't know where he learned that from, you know. But the reality is that some of us have opposition that happens to us, and we act like a child. We get mad at God. You know, like, God, you let this happen to me, right? Then you go into work, and you're like, no, nah, I'm not listening to worship music. <laughs> Turn it off. I'm going to be rude to everybody that's here, you know? We do it. We, 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 we start to get angry. We start to isolate ourselves. We start to rebel, and, man, that's what the devil wants. Because then you get him a foothold to begin to pull on those strings a little bit more and egg it on a little bit more and plant some more seeds. But can I be real honest with you today? On Father's Day, people are watching you, especially unbelievers. They are watching you. And they're watching how you handle the tough situations in life. They're watching how you handle opposition in your life. But I'm telling you right now, Christ followers, and you got to catch this, Know how to handle opposition in a way that inspires unbelievers so that when they're going through something similar, it gives us the opportunity to witness to them. We should live our life, and I'm not saying to be perfect. I mean, we're going to go through things that really get us down. I get that. But it should not affect the way that your faith is moving. And you should be able to use that faith 
to inspire other people that will look at you and be like, I have no idea how you even look like you have strength right now after losing that person in your life. And you're like, I don't know it either, but I know my word says that he gives a peace that transcends all understanding. I know that the word says if my God is for me, there's nothing that can stand against me. I know my word says that even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because Jesus is with me. See, we've got to get to a place where we're saying, look, I might have some opposition coming against me, but it will not stop my witness. Because unbelievers, listen, they saw how you handled that job loss. They saw how you handled that health diagnosis. They saw how you handled that gossip against your character when all they said wasn't true. And when you react in a godly way, you keep the influence of your witness so you can continue to be a witness to them. Paul is not yelling, help, help. He's not cursing back at them. He's not doing any of that. He calmly says, may I say something to you? Worship team, you guys can come back up. And then I want to read to you what happens next because we begin to see the true heart of Paul in the midst of this opposition and how he uses it for an opportunity. Acts chapter 21, verse 37. The guard said to him, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of assassins out into the wilderness? <laughs> Paul's like, What in the world are you talking about? There was so much confusion that was happening in that room where people were shouting lies about Paul that some people were even saying he was an Egyptian. Like, bro, do I even look like an Egyptian to you? Like, wild. Paul replied, I'm a Jew, girl, yo, from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. To do what? Permit me to speak to the people. Two things stood out to me right here. The first thing that stood out to me is the honor that Paul is showing. Because he could have easily turned around and did it himself, started talking to them, he could start cursing at them, you know, all that. But he asked the guard for permission. Can I speak to these people? Can I say something? And it says, when they gave him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And it says there was a great hush as he addressed them in his Hebrew language, saying, and if you want to know what he says, you got to come back next week. So, so next Sunday is going to be a good one, though. Like, not many times that I'm doing a, uh, a word that I got the other sermon already prepared because of Paul's response. It's going to be good. Invite somebody. People are going to get saved next week if, they, if you get some unbelievers here. I'm just going to tell you that. But I just imagine that. All the, the things that Paul could have did, yet... In the midst of the people lying about him, throwing slander at him, talking bad about him, he asked for an opportunity to speak to those people. And he, on the steps, turns around, looking at everybody. I mean, imagine, I'm just like trying to imagine what it looked like, you know? People rioting, throwing stuff probably at him. And he takes his hand and he does this. And they all hush. I think that was just the Holy Spirit. I think that was just the Lord giving him an opportunity to speak to them. Do we live our lives in such a way that we are desperate to witness to those who don't know Jesus? That we are so desperate that even though that person that's lying about you, your heart's breaking for them and you want to share the gospel with them. That even though that person, that boss that keeps doing you wrong, can't help but want to pray for them and speak Jesus to them. That when you're in Walmart or you're at a store and you're, you're overhearing a conversation about somebody's pain, does your heart break that they may know Jesus? How desperate are you to witness to those? That we would be willing to face the backlash, the resentment, the riots, so we can just tell people about Jesus. Do we have that type of mind? And Paul challenges us, guys. He challenges us 
that no matter the circumstance, no matter the opposition, the goal should always be to preach the gospel so people can hear about Jesus. Paul had this mindset. He told the Romans here in Romans chapter 10, verse 12, look, he said, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And look at this. It says, how then will they call on him who they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. In other words, Paul is saying, how will they ever know Jesus if we don't step up? If we don't witness? Listen, you have the greatest story in your arsenal that's ever been told. The gospel. The good news. When you share it with other people, you are giving them an opportunity to put their faith and their trust in someone named Jesus who can change everything. A few weeks ago, we went to two services, and I know that it's Father's Day, and I know that it's the summer crowd. I get that. But you look around the room, and you see the empty chairs. We went to two services so we could what? Make room. Make room for more life change. Who can you put in an empty chair? Who can you get? Who can you invite? That's why we put invite cards on your seats every single Sunday. So that it makes it easy to equip you to walk around and give somebody. I mean, take a few of them with you. It gives you an in, right? Like simply paying for some pay. Oh, when you're finish it paying at a waiter or waitresses uh, at a restaurant. You just put it on your bill. Paying for somebody behind you in a drive-thru. Hearing about somebody going through a hard thing at a store and just walking up to them and saying, hey, I didn't mean to intrude, but this may help. You don't realize that you are equipped with the greatest story ever, and it can change people's lives. Not only that, but you have a story. God's given you a story. You know what God's done in your life. Everything that's happened for you and how he continues to turn things around and that's what we're going to talk a lot about next week is that about your story you know Paul's going to essentially share his story you know sometimes you don't have to have you don't have to witness to people with this deep theological you know presentation of the gospel most people ain't going to take it that way but if you just share your story this is what God did in my life it can change everything I pray that you're challenged today to witness to other people no matter what opposition is facing in your life. That you would not compromise your faith, your character in the midst of that opposition or whatever's happening against you. And maybe right now you just need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to give you the boldness to keep going. As you all stand on your feet and we get ready to go in our time of response, listen, I want you to hear this. I believe there are people in this room and life is just getting you. Life is life. You ever felt that way? Life's just going to life sometimes. It just does it. And you are facing opposition. Anytime we see in the, in the book of Acts that the disciples would face an intense round of opposition or persecution, they would meet together and they would pray, Lord, we need you. And he would essentially refill them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He would literally pour out his spirit on them to give them what? Boldness to continue preaching the gospel. You can read Acts chapter 4 is one of those examples. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go into a time of worship. The team's going to play a song. It's called I Need Revival. Maybe that's where you're at today. I'm, I'm in need of revival. I'm in need of a fresh anointing of God's spirit on my life right now to give me the boldness to continue to do it in the midst